Okay, so for the purposes of the recording, the question was sort of about the politics and how the interaction between users and the Myth2 developers works, I think. Um, when I started with Myth TV, it was mailing lists and CVS, and that was it. So it was a source code and a mailing list. The developers might have had their own private mailing list um, in addition to the two public ones that you see. But basically, I, I found like, the initial interaction I had, I asked a question on the mailing device on the developer list, and I got an answer back and it fixed my problem, that was good. But I saw other interactions they didn't seem to be going well. So I, I, I saw at the start it was, it was a, maybe a difficult interaction for whatever reasons. Then I got on the FFmpeg developer list and I saw what, what a very low level projects have to do um, just to keep ticking over. So those who don't know about FFmpeg, there's about nine developers I think all over the world. Um, one major one in Germany, he's a bit of a, a code Nazi, I'll say. So, yes. So he, he's very good at looking at the very low level stuff and optimizing the assembly and things like that. But in terms of interacting with people who were submitting patches to the mailing list, um, pointing people towards a frequently asked, frequently asked questions list and stuff like that, um, because they're working on very low level stuff and that's a very exacting thing, I think the sort of people who are working on that project have had to be very, very strict in their dealings with users. Myth TV in a way has been like that, but I think the tools like the wiki for example, but especially track has made that a little bit, has made that a little bit easier in terms of, um, yeah, I think the, the processes and the politics and the way the interactions are happening are improving. But yeah, you may like to comment on that uh, at the end of this or maybe at the forthcoming talk, um, the panel -y sort of area. Anyway, from 2004 till now, or why your patches get ignored? I'll start you on the history tour. Once upon a time, in the middle of 2003, I bought a little PC motherboard, a VIA EPR M10,000. So I thought, this will be a good fun thing to play with. Um, it's got a low power processor so I can build into a little you know, rack mount in my, my TV case at home. Um, it's got a video decoder chip, so yeah, that'll be able to do great things with TV and video and stuff, and that'll be fabulous. Anyway, so mid-2003, by the end of 2003, Nigel tried Freevo because, well, it was just all too hard doing scripts and bits and pieces, and that was a nice Python front end that you customise and do stuff with. Freevo at the time promised the ability to record and play back TV. I never found the ability to record TV in Freevo. Um, maybe it was on some wikis and some mailing lists and people were exchanging scripts, but I never ever found it. Anyway, th by this time I'd, I'd bought a couple of DVB-T cards and was having fun with firmware and drivers and documentation and I think on one Saturday after about five hours I finally got a picture in mPlayer. Uh, it was very exciting. But there was a lot of frustration in that process. So we, we go forward about another four or five months and I started looking at NotMyth. And you know, it had all these great features and feature, tick, yep, tick, oh this does everything I'll ever want to do with TV and video. So let's start playing with that. So I got a distribution called NotMyth. It's a Debian distribution and it was supposedly tailored exactly for set-top boxes. So you install from the CD and it all works. I install from the CD. It all worked, except that it didn't support DVB-T. So I had some digital TV cards and I had an operating system and a, you know, quite, a, quite a nice system in terms of installation and everything. You know, it, it knew what sort of remotes I had and it detected all my hardware, except for the DVB-T card. So that started on more frustration. I got Gen 2 and I started building X windows and then because that was a dependence of Myth TV and then I had to build QT because that was a dependence of Myth TV and then there was free type and after about a week of compiling I got frustrated by that and went back to not Myth. It had the wrong kernel version, it had a 2.4 kernel and I think not Myth at the time had Myth TV 0.15 which didn't support DVB-T anyway. So I had to upgrade the kernel, I had to upgrade something so I could build the SVN the trunk version of no, CVS at that time, 
the version of Myth TV to try and support the digital card. I had to ask a question on the mailing list. Um, now, for some reason, I don't actually remember why, but while this, this PC compilation was happening on one bench at work, um, I'd recently bought a PowerPC Mac, um, a titanium, or it might have been a, an aluminium cased one anyway, so it was a 400 megahertz or a gigahertz. So it was, a, it was quite a reasonable machine, faster than any PC actually had at work at the time. And I started trying to compile Myth TV on the Mac OS. You know, it's a, it's a Unix, it came with a compiler and lots of things already installed. I wouldn't have to worry about compiling X Windows, which I was trying to do on Gen 2 at the time. So I thought this would be a nice shortcut. It wasn't, but that actually got me familiar enough with the code of Myth TV to start submitting patches. So between May and September, I submitted about 23 patches. Just, um, hi guys, here's a preliminary patch to fix some assumptions in the make files or the dot profiles. Now, it was assuming that everything that wasn't Linux was little ended and that didn't work for the PowerPC. Um, and there were, there were some, just some bad assumptions, some simple patches. As time went on, another guy called Jeremiah Morris, um, he got on, on board with me with that project of porting it to the Mac OS and we actually got something that could almost play back video. It was very exciting the first time I got that to do. So I had a little window there, it had SPS soccer. The colours were a bit strange, um, but it was all happening. It was a very exciting time. Um, then in December 2004 I got an email, totally out of the blue. Actually Jeremiah and I both got this email from Isaac saying, Hi guys, I was wondering if you'd like to have commit access to the CVS repository for Myth TV. I've been submitting most of your patches now without any changes and, well, that's the litmus test. <laughs> so that's the short story of how I became a Myth TV developer. Um, basically, I became familiar enough with the code, with the product, to be useful to the team and Isaac, the boss of Myth TV, stepped in and said, hey, would you like to do this? And yeah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah and I jumped at the chance. Here's a nice little graph. So I joined, started committing things about here, and the amount of codes, as I said earlier, roughly doubled since then. Um, this graph is from an interesting website called Olo, which I hadn't heard about until one of the developers pointed, pointed me to it um, about two weeks ago. And I'll just see if I can drag that on there. Um, so I'm there on, it's, it's a social sort of a site like Facebook or any of those sorts of things, um, but it's for coders. So it's got a number of projects, it does code analysis, it's got a history of the developers on the project, when they've committed, how much they've committed, it's a good fun tool. Um, I don't understand what kudos is yet, but you basically give kudos, I think it's sort of like developer karma, you give kudos to the other developers and they give you, um, it's like a recommendation sort of thing. So it's a, it's a weird little website, but you can, you can see basically how active the developers are in terms of total time of the uh, MythTV repository and also recent. And that somehow goes into the calculation, the ranking and stuff. Uh, I'm on a few different projects listed here. But oh, if the net's actually still working, oh, it's just a bit slow. American websites. Um, no, that's not my projects. Okay, that's why it took so long. It was pulling up several hundred projects. Oh, it's all too hard. I've got to log in and stuff. Ah, oh, good thought. Good thought. Have you actually used this tool or this product? Excellent. Of course, then it'll ask me to log in and stuff. <laughs> Let's try. <laughs> well, yeah, by the look of that, he's, he's been sitting around doing nothing for four years. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it gives you fun little things. So for this project, it summar actually summarises the check-ins. I haven't been doing a lot. Um, It also summarises the project by language. So earlier we had a question about how the number of code lines actually map to the directories, but here you can see how the code actually maps to per language. Um, according to this, XML is a large part of MythTV. 
Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, we'll have to go to the overall project. Um, let's click to the overall project. Hmm. Oh, there you go. You can see where the users are. <laughs> anyway, it's a little fun, a very fun little site. Um, I can't find a little graph I was looking for. Doesn't matter. Um, basically, it does a breakup of language for the project, and it, it says XML is a very large part of MythTV. It actually isn't. We just use it for configuration of the menus and stuff like that. Um, it's not as if we're writing. XML, which does anything interesting. I, we're just using it as a replacement for a config file. But it's an interesting tool. OK, source code. I mentioned a while ago, quite a while ago now, that we started with CVS. So when I joined the project, I'd go to work. Because work is behind a, a firewall, I wouldn't be able to connect to CVS. So I wouldn't be able to do any work there. I'd have to find a public internet, synchronize my CVS with the repository, do some programming. If I made enough changes in a f or too many changes in a file and I wanted to roll them back, if I didn't have a backup copy, I'd have to find an internet access point again to do a CVS diff. Um, that was all pretty frustrating. Um, until June 2005, the developers decided to change tools. Subversion is a wonderful source code management system. Um, I actually started on RCS at my employer a very long time ago. Um, Subversion just has so many nice features, I love it. Particularly, I can be on the train, I can find out the difference in the source code file I'm editing with the last version I synced, and I can revert it to that. So it's got enough stuff cached locally that if I really stuff up the source code tree, I can roll back individual bits of it without an internet connection. Wonderful stuff. Some people also do other tools on top of Subversion. They mainly do it because they don't have commit access. Um, but they still want to contribute to the Myth TV source development. So it's been a while since someone did it, but about six months ago, someone created their own Git repository, synchronized it with uh, the official Myth TV subversion, and started developing their own patches in their own repository. That means they could share their patches with people in a way, uh, apart from having to send tar files and having to synchronize those with the constantly changing source code in Myth TV. So Git is a good tool in terms of being able to, I guess, layer on top of the official development of a project. Um, yeah, I like that. <sighs> like most projects, source code development happens in a sort of a fairly linear way. There's a main branch. So I'll draw it on what's remaining of the whiteboard. Um, let's say this is when I joined. There'll be some changes. This might be a tag which becomes 0 0.17. There'll be some more changes. Um, some of those will be rolled back into our a fixes branch, so 0 0.17 fixes, etc. There'll be another thing that becomes 0 0.18, etc. Okay, so most projects and Myth TV most of the time do development like that. There's a stream of the code which the developers mainly use and people who are brave enough to, be, to use the experimental cutting edge stuff. And then there's stable tags and changes on top of that. When 0 0.20 came along, we did something interesting. So there was development happening in trunk, but we created a 0 0.20. Um, and then Isaac said, let's actually freeze trunk and work on 0 0.20. That was mainly because, oh, he's going to press the button. <laughs> ah, it's only, it's only little. It won't go across far. Uh, it's, it's a nice linear thing, so it fits under the, what, <laughs> under the screen. So Isaac said, let's actually freeze development on the, the main branch for a while and work on 0 0.20 because it had a few bugs. We'd created the tag, we'd pushed it out there, people were starting to create tarballs, it was starting to go into packages that people were shipping, and there were enough bugs for it to be an embarrassment. So what he did was, he freezed that and he said, let's actually make this work on this. This meant that 
people who were building packages could get that a lot faster because they didn't have to wait for a version. So basically what happened is 0 0.20 instantly became 0 0.20 fixes for about a month. And because we didn't want to duplicate effort, instead of what usually happens, which is fixes in the main tr branch went into one of the, the trunk branches, these actually got copied back to the main branch, which was, I've never heard of that happening in any source code development project or system. It may never happen again. But in that situation, it actually worked really well. So that's what I mean by branch merging has sometimes been backwards. It's actually gone from the thing which is meant to be the most stable one, that became development for a while, and then it was reincorporated back into the main branch. Very bizarre. Okay, bug reporting. As I mentioned earlier, when I joined, there was just mailing lists. Uh, I don't remember when it was in 2005, but someone said, Subversion's a great product, we should also investigate this track product. And the manufacturers of that, I can't remember the name of them, they were, thank you, they were very kind to give the Myth TV website developer whatever a license to run that. And the combination of that, of of track and subversion has been very, very good. Um, mainly because of the way they integrate together. Um, I'll, I think I'll get on, onto that. No, I don't get onto that next slide. I better say it now. So typically people will put tickets, bug reports, changes, change requests, patches, whatever, in a management system of some sort, in this case track. Um, often, there's not very good linkage between that and the actual source code repository. Um, it can be fixed with some customization, some scripting and whatever, but usually that's not a very good linking. Between subversion and track, um, there's some things that you get for free, some automatic features which are very nice. So if I'm, if I'm editing here in VI or whatever I'm using and I, yeah, I'm happy with this change and I want to commit to the repository, you know, subversion commit file, um, like all source code management systems, it has up the editor, it puts a little banner saying, um, you know, what is this, these are the files you're committing. There's a few shortcuts you can use which actually link it back to the track management system. So if I'm working on ticket 4567, if I put hash 4567 in the commit, that automatically gets linked to that ticket in track. So if you look at that trick and say this closed, I say closes hash 4567, then that ticket will be automatically closed in track without me having to do anything. But also in track there'll be a history, there'll be a link to the history of that source code file where I changed it. That's saved me probably about 40% of my time going back and checking how things changed and why. So, go for it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it was part of the standard product. There you go. Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's shipped with it, but yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, excellent. Fabulous. Yeah, what can I say? It's a fabulous product. I love it. Um, so yeah, that, that, that hook, which actually works, works both ways between the source code management system and the fault or the, the change um, management system has been very, very good. A great time saver for me. Track is fairly busy. Um, we're up to ticket number 6,000 today, um, which, which I guess is a sense of pride in that we've got through a lot of tickets, but it's also a sense of concern because are all of those bugs, have there really been that many bugs in the product I've been working on? Um, you know, how many of those were just closed because the developer said there wasn't enough documentation to support it, rather than spending the time going and interacting with the user? Often they don't actually give an, e an email address or anything so we can't interact with them, but sometimes they do and we don't have the time to chase them up. So it's a, sen it's a sense of pride and a sense of concern, I guess, that we've gone through 5,400 and something tickets. That said, there are 520 active at the moment and yeah, there was one closed today. So life goes on. I went to a conference, other people are checking in code, fixing bugs, adding features. It's all good. Oh yeah, I said at the start um, why your ticket, why your bug gets ignored. Well, part of the reason it gets ignored is that there's 520 open tickets. 
Um, not all those are faults, not all those are urgent, and the track product helps us manage those a little bit, but ultimately that's a lot of stuff to get through. Um, and there's only so many developers and so much spare time. Uh, nearly at the end of what I was going to say, knowing the code. So I mentioned in the earlier talk, Myth TV is a very complicated product. Um, I'm actually not a very good C++ programmer, so when I went through uni, I learnt C and Fortran and Occam and Smalltalk and none of this fancy object-oriented stuff. Like, Smalltalk was the most object-oriented language I ever learnt at uni. So I've had to do the hard yards in trying to learn C++. Part of that's been, on, been through playing with Myth TV, but I'm still not comfortable with the language, so my development and my bug fixing is sometimes very slow. Um, I don't know the difference between a virtual function and a pure virtual function. Well, I do, but I don't know why you use one in preference to the other. And that's a bit of a problem when I'm designing new classes and what have you. So I, I have to be fairly slow and methodical and sometimes ask the other developers, does this seem sensible? Um, but knowing the code. So the more you can you or I can delve into the code, understand how the classes all hang together, the better. The faster we can fix bugs, the faster we can add new features, whatever it may be. I mentioned earlier Doxygen uh, documentation. So Doxygen is a, a source code parsing tool. It usually automatically parses C++ methods and functions and gives you a nice function call graph and gives you a link to the source code. If you do a little bit more extra work, add some comments in, it makes it much better. I uh, don't think I've actually got any Doxygen handy to show you, but I'll try. Uh, no, not that window. Um, pardon me for a while while I troll through links. Okay, local doxygen, love it. Okay, so this is uh, my local build of the developer documentation on my local machine. It's a command that takes about half an hour to troll through all the source code and it builds basically, oh, where's my mouse? A huge list of classes. So they're all the named classes that MythTV locally defines. Um, if you want Doxygen run to run for about an hour, you can also add the QT source code in there. Um, the class gets a bit long. Um, these bits and pieces are just special tags that we've added in one source code as a comment with some quick little links. So, it's a, yeah, it's a fast way to, to find stuff. Um, let's try one I've worked on. So, this tells you what individual MythTV commands do when they start up, where they get all their runtime assets, all their config files from, etc. Um, so there's, there's a mixture of documentation in here. A lot of it may be better on, on the wiki, but I like having it in the source code. It's just my preference. Um, get rid of that one. Back to you. So, Doxygen, knowing the source code. The other thing, another good thing to know is the trends of where the source code's going. That's a little bit harder. Um, some of the developers use the wiki or Olo to report what they're working on, what their priorities are. I never have enough time to do that, so I tend not to, but I sometimes announce things on the mailing list or in uh, track tickets about things I'm working on. They'll often look like suggestions, so if I'm fixing a bug, I'll say something, okay, this has fixed it for now, what I really should do is blah, 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 and blah. That might be a restructuring or an updating of documentation or whatever. Um, but yeah, the other developers are a bit better with that in terms of announcing, well, having a plan, I guess, and working, working on it. Complexity. I've mentioned a few times it's a complicated product. That's, I think, the main reason why things don't get fixed faster. Um, it would be nice to say that you can just re-engineer it and make it easier to work on, but the people who need to do that re-engineering are busy fixing the bugs and slowly enhancing it uh, both structure-wise and feature-wise as well as they can. Um, 
Throwing more developers at the problem doesn't usually help. There was a famous book called The Mythical Man Month. Double the developers, I think it was four times the time spent total on the project. So, sadly, just throwing more resources at a problem doesn't often help. <laughs> there may be an optimization function there where you suggest that to Isaac. Send him an email saying, Nigel's saying complexity was a problem. Take him away from the product and it will work better. Uh, knowing the developers, you saw the OLA list of developers before, but basically Isaac's the guy who's been with the project from the start. Um, he's given good direction a, a few times during my working with the project. Um, he and Daniel, that, that he recently in particular been working on some optimizations. Um, why is this screen, particularly in the new Myth UI, take 30 seconds to load if I've got 400 recordings? Um, so yeah, drilling down to the classes, the, the, con the construction sequence for those, trying to speed it up a little bit. Daniel, uh, he actually got some funding once upon a time to work on the recorder stuff. So he tends to focus on how Myth TV records and plays back things, uh, things like channel scanning fixes that people have committed, mainly because he's more comfortable with that part of the code. I don't think he's got any particular passion for it. I find that part of the code of Robert Warren, but good on him if he wants to work on it. Stuart and Isaac. Uh, Isaac's had a ticket for revamping the UI for three years. Um, Stuart has been doing a lot of work on that recently, making, that, making the screens prettier, but also taking away some of the hard-coded assumptions in some of the screens. So a lot of you who've got Myth TV, you've been looking at the watch recording screens, it's a, it's a fixed format. Down the left-hand side, there's the categories of recording. So it might be the name of the recording or, f or comedy, drama, home improvement, whatever it may be. Down the right-hand side, there's the actual recordings, the date, etc. Down the bottom, there's the details and a uh, little thing. That's that was hard-coded in Myth TV for five years, since before it was actually even in a repository. It was a reasonable way to go, but people want more flexibility. People want to be able to theme everything, have things do pretty stuff. So there's been a long-standing ticket to re-engineer that to allow a lot more flexibility. That's finally happened. Uh, a guy called Stanley, he works on a lot of the internal DVD player stuff. Chris has been the guy who's single-handedly produced this Myth Web product. It is fabulous. If you've ever been away from your box and you've opened up uh, HTTP access, so you've been on holidays and you've watched something, you want to delete off your box because your box is about to get filled, you go to MythWeb, you delete it from the other side of the world and you go home and your box won't be full. Well, maybe you need to delete more than one recording, but you know what I mean. And lastly there's me. I started with OS X porting and I still work a bit on porting, so every couple of months I'll try and do a free BSD build to make sure it still works on that. Um, the Windows guys, I helped a bit with that in the start. When they come along with crazy fixes, I try and slow them down a bit and say, maybe you need to fix the problem rather than just patching these 14 source code files. Um, and the media mo oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. What's the state of um, the Windows port now that um, Q4 is compiled using Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, how do I answer that? Um, okay, the Windows guys want it all rather than just focusing on the Myth front end, which is frustrating me a little bit, but they may eventually get a Myth back end that can do more than just sit there and list for connections and do nothing. So good luck to them if they work out how to make it record. Basically, there's a couple, of, there's a build script that was produced that did and I think still does build a Windows front end. That's 021 fixes, so it's only using QT3. It, pat we, it has local patches in it for QT3 to get it to all compile. QT4, yes, it does compile natively on Windows. Yes, it should fix all the problems. No, it doesn't. Um, so there are bugs in the build environment part of QT for Windows that I've submitted bug, uh, bug fixes back to Troll Tech. They've basically ignored them. That frustrates me, but it's their project, it's their life. Um, so the trunk version of that Windows build script 
also has to do some patching for QT4. Uh, last October, November, the Windows front-end builds were briefly working on Trunk, um, and then a whole lot of structural changes happened, and then the MingW guys upgraded from 5.13 to 5.14, which took away some symbols, which mean a lot of things like free type and whatever do not build cleanly on Windows anymore. So that's what I mean about working the problem rather than patching 15 or 16 source code files. You can patch one f source code file in, in the, the text rendering part library, and then you can go and patch 15 in Myth TV. But the real, real way to fix it is to change or change to a version of free type that will actually compile on them in W and they're not there yet. So that yeah, I I, I could just apply their patches and they'd be it'd be happy for a while, but it, it's not really the right way to fix the problem. And Yeah, yeah. Yeah, correct. So there's th there's a fairly large set of dependencies. Like it, it's not huge. It's you know five libraries sort of thing, well five products and Qt. But if the MingW you're trying to use, so the the Unix emulation environment you're trying to use to compile that stuff changes and takes away the underscore Win32 symbol, so that half your source code doesn't compile anymore or doesn't compile cleanly, or when it compiles it doesn't think it's actually running in a Windows environment, then you've got big problems. Um, so yeah, porting, that's what I've done uh, more than I really want to concentrate on lately, but that's what I've been working on. And the media monitor I mentioned earlier, I've done a fair bit of work on that, trying to make it usable with multiple drives, with hot plug USB, USB devices, etc. Last slide, recent changes. Recent is in quotes because 0.9M was a long time ago. In fact, 0.21 was a long time ago. But there are things I can remember. 0.19, well before 0.19 Live TV had to have its own directory configured on your back end. Um, if you watch some Live TV then you said, oh I wouldn't mind watching the rest of this program. Um, pressing record would have to try and schedule it on a second tuner because you're busy using that tuner for Live TV. It was all a bit messy. Um, someone, I think it was Isaac, eventually worked out a way of doing that. It was quite easy. So now, not that the developers use Live TV because it's a PVR and you don't want to do that stuff. But if you're watching live TV, you can channel change, you can press record. The recording there is in the same place as all your other recordings. That's cool. I can't remember any good parts of 0 0.20. The only one I can remember is the UPnP server. So that means that the Myth backend, you could buy these little hardware boxes, they could connect to it, you could watch your videos, listen to music, and watch some of your TV recordings on this little box. There are other things, but I can't remember them. Oh, didn't you like the UPnP support? Oh dear. What? <laughs> hmm. Cool. Nine months is good. The most I've managed is about four or five months. <laughs> That's good. Um, so yeah. 0 0.20, we'll forget about that, it's too long ago. 0 0.21, UPnP auto config, so your front end should automatically find a back end or a number of back ends and you get to choose which one to connect to. Storage groups. My, my machine at home was on 0 0.19 for nearly two years because it was being used all the time and I didn't have time to bring it down to copy all the recordings across to a bigger hard disk and then bring it up. Storage groups, you can now magically add another disk or a number of disks. The back end, hopefully, in an egalitarian algorithm, has your recordings across those multiple disks. It's all nice. Multi-rec. Who has heard or tried to use multi-rec on Myth TV? Okay, a reasonable number. I've actually only recently tried to be brave enough to use it. I thought enough of the bugs were out. Very nice. Yeah. So multi-rec is mainly for digital broadcasters who aren't the digital broadcasters in Australia. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So worldwide digital TV, most of them they 
transmit more than one channel per frequency. In, the, in Australia, some, for some reason, the broadcaster decided that they couldn't do that. They wanted their guaranteed large bandwidth allocation and they're only going to show you their stuff on it. And then the government forced them to play high def and low def on that same channel at the same time and it's all a big mess. But basically, multi-rec in other countries and to a certain extent Australia means you can record more than one thing from one tuner card. It's quite sweet. It's also on the same multiplex and so that, that's not terribly useful when Channel 7 and Channel 7 HD are showing the same thing but since about a year ago a few of the broadcasters start showing different things on their high def versus their standard def channel and it's been a little bit handy. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes, there are still bugs. I said I didn't use it yet, that's why. <laughs> it sort of works. Yep, yep. Yep. As Australia's a bit unique in that Australian users have to set it to record five minutes early and you know, 20 or 30 or 50 minutes late because the mongrel broadcasters can't even stick, no, can't even read the time basically. Or they want to cram more ads in or whatever they do. Ah, oh, New Zealand's bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And also stop people from changing channels. When there's something on channel 9 at 8.30, we won't make our 7.30 program run 20 minutes late. Bastards. Anyway. Background music was in 021 as well, so the, the horrible music, much maligned plug-in, um, when you exit it now, it can actually play music in the background for a slideshow, or if you want to troll through the TV guide or whatever. Um, sadly, 021 needed a newer MySQL. Um, since then, we've moved to QT 4.3, and about a week ago, or a week and a half ago, 4.4, because we've started using, it's not required, but it's it's needed for one of the screens which now uses a built-in web display browser thingy. Um, ask me about that if you really care. There's experimental multi-core decoding of H.264. It doesn't seem to make much difference, but yeah. So it's, it's not incredibly useful, but people are thinking about it. And within the last month, we've had VDPAU support added incredibly quickly. I don't know how. Um, I thought it would be months, but basically some drivers became available, uh, sorry, available and before the underlying FFmpeg guys got to, got to make it happen, um, it was added in Myth TV. <sighs> I don't know how. It's fabulous. Sure. Mm-hmm. Fast hardware is usually the easiest way to go. <laughs> what can I say? Anyway, VDPRU, new user interface. Let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, not everyone would have seen this. Um, I haven't played with it much. But let's look at a, a new theme. Um, this is one that was committed about a week ago. It's an official theme. It's not in the themes plugin. It's in the Myth TV source. So it's likely to be very well supported and maintained. Um, it's a little bit slow because I haven't got the latest optimization fixes that Isaac committed eight hours ago. <laughs> I don't know why. Program guide, upcoming recordings. Uh, oh no. No, we won't go there. We'll go somewhere else. We'll just go to that screen, I'm sorry to say. Click the wrong button. So, remember I was talking to you earlier about the very hard-coded way that recordings were displayed. It was the categories down the left, the recording listings down the right, and the uh, little snapshots down the bottom. Well, we've got my, my box has only got a few different recordings on it, but that shows you this is basically just defined in a theme. So there's an XML file somewhere that says there's an element across the top which is a, a menu linked to this item in the code. 
there's this display scrolling thing that goes big in the middle, highlighting the one you're looking at. Then there's additional status information down the bottom. Um, if I had more recordings and more information and more flags, it'd look much prettier. But we're getting there. Um, that's that's a lot more flexibility, and it means that some users will be a lot happier because they'll be able to make it beautiful, um, and some people won't care less, and that's cool with me too. <laughs> that's all the pretty.